your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians tonight. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. I wish we might have time tonight to read this entire fourth chapter, but we do not have that time available at the present. But I would like to suggest to you that you read it very carefully sometime with a great alacrity and understanding. For instance, in the first verse, it says, therefore. And whenever the Bible says, therefore, you ask yourself one question, why for? And you have to go back into the previous chapters of 2 Corinthians to find out why he says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Apparently it's, it's possible to handle the word of God deceitfully, isn't it? And many places across our nation, people who are sincere are still handling the word of God deceitfully. Sincerity is no guarantee for truth. The accuracy of God's word is its own truth. And the Apostle Paul, writing this tremendous revelation to the church, said that he was thankful to God for his mercy, that they had allowed him to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking craftily, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. And so as you go on, he says in verse 3, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Why? Verse 4, Because the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them, and the people get saved and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. If the gospel is hidden today, it's hidden to men and women who are lost. Why? Because the God of this world, and the God of this world is Satan. There are very few people who believe that there are two gods. They think there's only one God, and that God is the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that's all that's to it. The Bible says there are two gods. One who is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the other is the God of this world. And the God of this world is a spiritual power, even as our Heavenly Father, who is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is spiritual power. And spirit can only operate if it has a body to utilize or a body to operate via or through. Now the greatness of this tremendous record here in Corinthians, if you follow it down through that chapter, it tells you in verse 14, for instance, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus Christ shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. And he goes on to say in verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by what? Day. So there, we are two people, so to speak. We are the outward man, the man of the flesh, that which you see standing here before you, that which I see seated before me. That's the outward man, the outward person, but you are something else. You have Christ in you, and when you're born again of God's Spirit having Christ in you, you have an inner man. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that inward man, that power of God in you, which is called holy, which is called spirit, that is renewed day by day by the operations of the manifestations of the Spirit. So he says in verse 17, For our light affliction, a light affliction, Dr. Williams was talking about the hardships we endured in India. I never thought about it till he mentioned it tonight. <laughs> they weren't hardships, they were just opportunities. Why, time and time again, I'd take a cow and just on the rear a little bit and push it to the side because it was standing on the roadway or in the sidewalks. 
or it was standing in the in the place where we went up to go to sleep someplace the hotel he was standing in the front door so I push him over a little and I remember one one time we were driving in a Jeep and we had to stop to push the baboons off of the road the monkeys Rector you'd enjoyed this place with all those wild animals uh, the that's right they were so thick you just couldn't get through them driving. You just drove down the road and then you'd go over in the ditch a while and then they'd come over toward the ditch and you'd go back on the road. you just play like cat and mouse with them. But uh, I never thought about this. The places we went, like we had, as he said, six people, five plates. He forgot to tell you we had only one knife and three forks. Uh, <laughs> but it was tremendous. Never thought about them being hardships. I remember the Half Kind Institute is the doctor still there at the Halfkind Institute in Bombay? He has left. The Halfkind Institute in Bombay is where the cholera serum was developed many, many years ago. You remember cholera was referred to as the Black Death, and it was conquered via the work that was done at the Halfkind Institute. And because of our travels and the places we were going to go, I believe we had to have some kind of shot or something. I forget what was it for anymore typhoid and everybody was concerned about us because it was such a hardship to take a typhoid shot because your arm swells up like a big balloon and all the rest of these little matters so as soon as we as we had gone to the half kind institute and dr solman if i remember his name accurately was it at the time dr solman a very wonderful gentleman he gave us that shot and he was all concerned about it he said, I hope you get along all right, and so on. If not, come back and see me. We went back to the hotel room at the Taj Mahal in Bombay, and all five of us laid our hands on each other's arms where we had received these shots, and we commanded that in the name of Jesus Christ they couldn't get sore, and lo and behold, they never did get sore. They never swelled up or anything else. If I remember correctly, all those months when we were in India, not one of us was ever sick. We never lost a day. We never lost an hour. And they, these things look to people, you know, like great afflictions, but they're not. It all depends on how you look at afflictions. They become light when you've got a big enough vision. Why, when I think of what some of our people went through in past for a knowledge of God's Word, how they used to take one sheet of the Bible, bake it in a loaf of bread, and slip it across the boundary line from one county, so to speak, into another county in Germany, that they could even read a little bit of the Word of God. When I think of the thousands who were thrown to the lions and to the other animals in the, the great Colosseum at Rome, when I think of the sacrifices that were made of Christians in Ephesus and the rest of the places, where is there anyone seated in this auditorium tonight or listening to my voice who has paid anything for their knowledge of God's Word or the power of God that's in us. Why, they are not afflictions, they're just opportunities. Remember the illustration I give in my foundational class many times about the, the brook? The reason the brook sings is because it has some rocks in it, and that brook just doesn't know any different, so it just sings. The rocks do not obstruct the water. If the rock is big enough, the water simply increases itself and goes around the outside of it. And if the rock is still too big, that water never argues with it. It just builds up and finally goes over the obstruction. But for most people, a little rock in their life becomes the focal point, and they center on that as a problem, and then before they know it, they succumb to the problem rather than to go around it or go over the top of it. These are just opportunities. Why, when that greatness of God's Word lives within the heart or life of a young man or an older man or a young woman or an older woman, they burn with that enthusiasm of the glory of the presence of Christ, and you just walk with an effervescence and with a glow. And things that were problems before simply now become opportunities. Things that were obstructions before are no longer there. We just go around them or go over the top of them. Therefore, my people, when he writes things like this, it thrills my soul. He says, these light afflictions, they're but for a moment, for they work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are what? Seen, but at the things which are not seen. And isn't that tremendous? You don't keep your eyes upon things of the world. 
You don't keep your eyes upon that which you can see with your senses. You don't condition your spiritual reaction by what the senses tell you. You condition your spiritual reaction by what the Word of God says. Isn't that wonderful? 